Perhaps one of the greatest tragedies in Tolkien's beautifully woven legends was the turning of Saruman the White. As one of the most powerful Istari, Saruman found himself at the end of his tether as the ages passed. In this marvelous video, we will dare to touch the plaguing hands of the shadow to see the White Wizard's journey from start to finish. Was he always envious of Gandalf the Benevolent, or were those seeds planted by his endless greed for power? Could you imagine a more terrible power than Saruman's megalomania if he ever got his hands on the One Ring? Let's talk all about it. But before we get into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Who was Saruman in Tolkien's lore? We'll begin where most of Tolkien's tales began, before the beginning of the world. Before the Order of Wizards were sent to Middle-earth, they were the Maiar. The Maiar were spirits, a few of the Ainur who helped the Valar shape the world. Keep in mind that each of these Maia was allied to one or more Valar. For instance, Sauron, in his days of good grace, was named Myron and was one of Aule's pupils along with Koromo, aka Sauriman. Now, do you think it's simply a coincidence that two of the most powerful Maiar under Aule turned out to be irredeemably evil? As we know, Aule, the master smith, was one of the Aratar who controlled the ambar substances and specialized in the craftsmanship of rock and metal, a theme we will soon see in Sauriman's corruption of Isengard and the surrounding forests. One might easily argue that Aule was far from perfect. In fact, he was the impatient one who created the dwarves without Iluvatar's knowledge. He overstepped his role in Iluvatar's vision. Now, who else do we know who started out with passive rebellion and ended up being a host of evil? Fionor can also be considered Aule's greatest master pupil failure. All of Aule's apprentices had one thing in common. They were too proud of their skill in creation. The presumptuous Aule was Tolkien's way of expressing his descent towards industrialization and the growing mechanical world of his time. But back to the White Wizard, Saruman was known as Kuromo or Terendor in Quenya during his days in Valinor. Shortly after Iluvatar's firstborn elves awoke by the shores of Quivenin, they were discovered by the Vala Orome. The Valar sought to liberate these elves elves from Morgoth's tyranny over all of Middle-earth. They launched their forces against Morgoth in the War of the Gods. All this while, the Valar, Orome, and Tolkis had guarded the elves for many years. Since the two Valar had to leave to fight in the war, a group of Maiar were sent to watch over the elves instead. This group consisted of Terendor, aka Saruman, Olorin, aka Gandalf, Ravendil, who we know as Radagast, and two other. The Appearance and Characteristics of Saruman in Tolkien's Lore Before Koromo left Valinor, he was depicted with long black hair and a sharp youthful face. But, as the Third Age came to an end, Saruman took on the appearance of an older man with long white hair and an equally lengthy beard adorning his shrewd face. He gained his name due to the robes he wore, white as a winter's first snow. But later, this transformed into a cloak that changed colors as per his will. Saruman was often described as having a long face with dark eyes that always appeared to be calculated. Being in service of the Valar, the Maiar were given their physical bodies with the appearance of wizened old men when they arrived on Middle-earth. Saruman was the first to be sent into the darkness-ridden lands where he interacted with the men. Even though he appeared elderly, he hardly aged as time passed. The Order of Wizards, or the Istari, led by Saruman the White, were said to have many powers of mind and hand. The History of Saruman in Tolkien's Lore the five guardians were sent to protect the first elves, but as the Third Age approached, Sauron was finally defeated by the last alliance of elves and men. But the Valar feared that the Dark Lord's evil wasn't entirely destroyed. At the same time, the Valar were understandably hesitant to intervene since the last time they did directly, it nearly broke all of Beleriand. A council held by Monwe decided to send a group of emissaries for the sole purpose of protecting the free peoples of Middle-earth. Kuromo eagerly volunteered to lead the party, but soon turned disgruntled as Olorin was chosen to be his second in command rather than third. Many believe this was the precise moment that ignited Kuromo's long lived envy of Olorin. He was incredibly envious of how well regarded Olorin was in the eyes of the most benevolent Valar. So, the five emissaries sent by the Valar were meant to be the mighty peers of Sauron, yet forego might and clothe themselves in flesh. So, the Istari could match up in power to Sauron, but they were strictly forbidden from forcing said power to the free peoples of Middle-earth. In the year 1000 of the Third Age, Kuromo swiftly arrived in the Grey Havens. 
He had deliberately left Iwindel, or Radagast, behind, who accompanied Olorin into Eriador shortly after. But Sirdan the Shipwright, one of the oldest and wisest elves to exist, saw right through Koromo's facade. So the elves settled on gifting Narya, the Red Ring of Power, to Olorin instead. When the White Wizard discovered this fact, his jealousy of Olorin grew, and a tiny seed of bitter loathing took root as well. The fear of being usurped as the leader of the Astari seized him, as Olorin had just been unofficially knighted as the wisest of the Astari, a mantle which was Kuromo's on paper. The elves recognized Kuromo as Kuranir, while the men referred to him as Saruman the White. Sauriman, along with the two blue wizards, journeyed into the eastern lands where they remained for the next 1,500 years. Sauriman only returned when a notable shadow had fallen over Greenwood with reports of a malevolent presence lurking in Dol Guldur. In the year 2463 of the Third Age, the White Council was formed. Initially, Lady Galadriel wished for Gandalf to be the leader of the council, but he was stubbornly overtaken by Sauriman, who revered only himself. By this point, Sauron's one ring to rule them all had fallen into the slimy hand of Smeagol, who had crawled into the caves of the Misty Mountains. It was believed that Sauriman the White spent a lot of time in the city of Minas Tirith, where he sat sifting through their archives studying the lore of the One Ring. He also guessed that one of the Seeing Stones, a Palantir, would be found locked away in Orthang, one of the main towers in Isengard. When Freilaf Hildeson of Rohan was knighted as king, Sauriman made sure he attended the coronation in order to shower him with presents and flattering words. The White Wizard managed to win the support of King Freilaf and Baron, the steward of Gondor. The leaders of men truly believed Saruman possessed nothing but goodwill and a sense of duty to protect their kind. So, they handed Saruman the keys to Orthanc, where the wizard set up shop as the Warden of the Tower. Here, he skulked away in the darkness with his hands finally on the Orthanc stone. Contrary to popular belief, the Palantiri weren't inherently evil objects, but in this case, Sauron possessed the other seeing stone in Middle-earth. Through the Ithil Stone, the Dark Lord slyly manipulated the Orthanc Stone, and with it, Saruman the White. Tolkien stated that Saruman was never afraid of Sauron. Instead, he desired to gain dominion over Middle-earth in the way that the Dark Lord did. Saruman never once revealed his use of the Seeing Stone to the White Council. This was only the beginning of his dark web of lies. Exploring the conflicting personality of Saruman the White. Although Saruman and Gandalf looked similar in their worldly bodies, the two were fundamentally different in character. Don't we all love good old Gandalf the Grey? The wizard, imbued with pity and patience thanks to his time spent with Nienna as opposed to Saruman, who was always haughty and impatient. Saruman was far from humble, proudly knighting himself as the wisest of the Astari. We don't know about the wisest, but he was undoubtedly the most arrogant of them all. Are we surprised at the fact that Saruman severely disliked Radagast the Brown? He believed the wizard to be a fool fellow as his excessive consumption of mushrooms had addled his brains and yellowed his teeth. Even before the Order of Istari arrived on Middle-earth, Saruman remained envious of Gandalf the Grey. That envy began to gnaw away at his soul, clouding all logical reason. Saruman would rather chew off his own foot than admit that he had actually started to see Gandalf as an equal, if not a genuine threat. Saruman soon grew paranoid, convincing himself that Gandalf was actually conspiring against him. Even though Saruman despised the foolish Radagast, he still learned the tricks of the brown wizard's trade of taming the birds and beasts. He then used this power to his own advantage by setting up spies far and wide across the lands, all for the purpose of spying on Gandalf the Grey. During this time, Saruman noticed Gandalf's friendly relations with the hobbits of the Shire. He went as far as to place spies all the way from Bree to South Farthing. Over time, Saruman the White became the very thing he swore to destroy in the first place an agent of darkness who sought to possess the One Ring before the Dark Lord found it. But his attempt to butt heads with Sauron backfired horribly as the Dark Lord carefully manipulated Saruman's lust for power, supplementing his own mission. To put it simply, Saruman's unbreakable pride strayed him from the path of benevolence. Saruman the Wise? More like Saruman the Bitter and Forever Resentful. <laughs> Saruman's downfall and his relations with the Dark Lord Sauron. So, in the year 2850 of the Third Age, Gandalf confirmed that the necromancer lurking by Dol Guldur was indeed Sauron. The Grey Pilgrim insisted that their forces must narrow down on the fortress and nip this evil in the bud while they still could. But Saruman overruled this plea, falsely deeming it unnecessary. Of course, the White Wizard's true intentions were to let the Dark Lord regather his strength and set out in search of his One Ring. Once Sauron's pursuit revealed the ring's location, Saruman planned to swoop in and get his hands on it first. 
This was when Gandalf slightly doubted Saruman's reasoning, but when Sauron's scheming worked against the White Wizard's brilliant plan, he finally relented and attacked Dol Guldur. Following this, the White Council met for one of the last times when Saruman claimed that the One Ring had sunk to the bottom of the Sundering Seas. The Council suspected his treachery, which was soon confirmed when Saruman further fortified Isengard and summoned all those who hated Rohan and Gondor. He basically meant the rancid orcs from the Misty Mountains and the Dunlendings, who were bitter foes of the Rohirrim. Aragorn even attempted to warn Steward Ecthilien II, son of Turgon, to be wary of the White Wizard, but in vain. By this time, Sauron had fled back to Mordor following his banishment from Dol Guldur. But the Dark Lord managed to take over Minas Ithil, which became known as Minas Morgul. Here, Sauron established uninterrupted contact with Saruman, further ensnaring him in his vice-like grip. False promises of endless glory were made, and the wizard was handed a deceptive mantle of power. So, Saruman was led to believe that he possessed power in his own right, remaining relatively autonomous. In reality, he had just become one of Sauron's most valuable sets of eyes in Middle-earth's northwest. <laughs> How powerful was Saruman? As an agent of Sauron, Saruman the White was free to explore a whole new arsenal of deadly abilities. None of this was to say that Saruman wasn't powerful without Sauron. In fact, his voice was one of his most defining abilities. Saruman the Wise wasn't just convincing, his voice cast a spell on its listener, or victim should we say, as it was capable of swaying any and all decisions. He could even convince the listener of lies that he craftily planted in their minds. Case in point, when he attempted to inform the wise of the One Ring's whereabouts. Obviously, they were beings nearly as powerful as him, so this didn't entirely work. In another instance, his persuasive voice convinced the Witch King of Angmar that he had never heard of the One Ring, let alone the Shire, during the initial hunt for Sauron's ring. Tolkien also noted that Saruman could walk the Earth entirely unnoticed, like when he snuck up on Gimli, Aragorn, and Legolas in the chapter titled Riders of Rohan in the Two Towers book. We even consider Saruman one of the most powerful beings to exist on Middle-earth, alongside the likes of Sauron and Tom Bombadil. As one of the Maiar, some of whom descended to help the Valar shape the world, Saruman was essentially a primordial spirit with a diverse array of powers. He had control of the birds and the beasts, using them as spies for his dirty work. After becoming Sauron's pawn, Saruman structured his battle strategy in a way that ensured his foe's destruction. We've also seen examples of Saruman utilizing his knowledge of chemistry, in a magical sense, to be used as blasting power. Not to forget that Saruman genetically crossbred two races to create a new and improved breed of orc known as the uruk -hai. It was said that Saruman's corruption was complete in the year 3000 of the Third Age, as the wizard had tried to unearth the knowledge of Region in order to make a ring of power for himself. This tells us how knowledgeable he was in ring lore after dedicating years of his life to studying the rings of powers, also he could emulate the one ring. This exile crept from the shadows will never be crowned king. What role did Saruman play in the War of the Rings? Now, Saruman the White only desired a singular thing, the One Ring to be precise. His whole scheme from the beginning till the end was to allow Sauron to gather strength, establish dominion over Middle-earth, become an equal to the Dark Lord as one of his lieutenants, or just swindle him for the One Ring to rule them all. In the years preceding the War of the Ring, Saruman discreetly made a slimy alliance with King Theoden's chief counselor, Grima Wormtongue. With the White Wizard in his ear, Grima advised his king not to retaliate against Sauron's growing evil plaguing the plains of Rohan, for it served Saruman's larger purpose. With Wormtongue's relentless whispers full of deceit and manipulations, King Theoden and his kingdom soon fell into the shadow, unkempt and weakened beyond measure. If it wasn't for Gandalf, who rescued the king out of his reverie, Grima Wormtongue would have earned total control over the realm of Rohan. The orcs we mentioned before were ordered to raid all of Idoris's eastern villages, while the valley by the foot of Methedris had become an area of brutal industrialization. Also, remember the spies he stationed where the hobbits lived? Saruman went one step further by allying himself with a few families of the Sackville Baggins and Brace Girdles through generous tradings of pipe. Saruman gained dominion over a few regions of the Shire as well. Gandalf soon arrived at Isengard in search of counsel, also rich with the whereabouts of the One Ring. Soon enough, Saruman's deception was uncovered and the Grey Pilgrim was held captive at the top of the tower. Looking down the Grey Tower, Gandalf observed that Saruman had begun gathering his armies of uruk -hai, Orcs, and Dunlendings. But before Saruman could torture and send Gandalf over to the big guy, the wise one managed to escape, riding atop Gwaihir, the lord of the Great Eagles. 
By this time, Saruman had convinced the Witch King with his persuasive voice, but this treachery was soon blown apart by his own spies in Hobbiton. They revealed who had the One Ring in their possession and where they were headed next. Shook out of his delusion of autonomy, Saruman the White scrambled to reassure Sauron that he was faithful. But then, Saruman's forces failed to capture the ring at Emin Mule as Frodo and Sam continued on to Mordor while his foolish Uruks caught Merry and Pippin instead. Funnily enough, the capture of Merry and Pippin would land the hobbits in Fanghorn Forest where the Ents were encouraged to rally against Saruman's Iron Fist. This, of course, led to the total annihilation of Isengard. Saruman's position as Sauron's loyal lieutenant was dangerously threatened, so he resorted to violently assaulting Rohan, killing Theoden's son, Theodred, in the process. Also, Gandalf believed that Saruman had found and desecrated Isildur's remains since the former High King of Arnor and Gondor had bore the ring before Frodo. Before he knew it, Saruman was faced with utter defeat as Gandalf had secured Rohan's victory. Eomer gathered his riders against his tyranny at once, and even Isengard was destroyed. There was a split second when Saruman considered repentance, but again, his pride stopped him. The disgraced wizard foolishly attempted to befriend, ahem, bewitch Theoden, but Gandalf stepped in. Gandalf the Grey had returned as Gandalf the White to actualize the Astari's goal, something Saruman had failed at horribly. His mantle as the leader of the Astari was revoked and his staff broken. In the end, Saruman finds himself in Hobbiton, where he establishes himself as a local gangster whom the hobbits know as Sharky. But even this came to an end when Frodo and Sam returned home from their arduous quest. He remained wandering Middle-earth as a disembodied spirit, unwanted by the gods of the West and the evil that was now vanquished. Do you know how the orcs first came into being. How did Saruman corrupt Isengard and breed the uruk -hai? Isengard was an unbreakable fortress which was established in the Second Age around the same time when the kingdoms of Gondor and Arnor came into being. But as the last alliance of elves and men was formed, the exiles of Numenor built the rocky walls known as the Ring of Isengard around the central tower named Orthanc. Here, one of the seven seeing stones, which came to be known as the Orthanc Stone, was placed. As per tradition, the fortress of Isengard was managed by Gondorian chieftains who inherited the title of Lord of Isengard for generations to come. Before Saruman's corruption, Tolkien described Isengard as being surrounded by lush green lands with the river Isen running around the Ring of Isengard. We already mentioned how Saruman became the Lord of Orthanc. Soon after, the river was dammed and the surrounding forest raised. The valley of Nan Kuronir surrounding the fortress soon turned into a slave's flattery of Mordor. In act after act of sacrilege, Saruman dug underneath the valley of Isengard, establishing underground workshops and forges made purely of malice, metal, and machinery. Although Tolkien himself discouraged his view from looking at his stories as allegory, he never denied that the industrialization of England during his childhood affected him greatly. In fact, Tolkien avidly disliked industrialization, as can be seen in his depictions of Isengard and its corruption. In the year 2990 of the Third Age, Saruman the White had used his learned magic to create a new and improved breed of orcs. The uruk -hai, he called them, were a cross between northern orcs and men. Keep in mind that these were inspired by the black orcs or uruks of Mordor. Saruman's experimental orcs were also known as Isengarders, far more powerful and resilient than regular orcs. They bore the white hand of Saruman upon their helms as a symbol of their loyalty. Most notably, forces of tens and thousands of uruk -hai fought in the Second Battle of the Fords of Isen and the fateful Battle of Hornburg by Helm's Deep. Whom do you serve? Saruman. When exactly did Saruman turn evil? Obviously, this moment wasn't as sudden and shocking since the White Wizard had always been conniving in his ways. As we mentioned, Saruman had remained jealous of Gandalf since before the beginning of time. This festered for thousands of years, and we mustn't forget that he was yet another one of Aule's pupils who was susceptible to corruption. Although Saruman's purpose on Middle-earth was to counter Sauron's evil, he saw himself agreeing with the Dark Lord's worldview. The White Wizard had an innate desire for dominion and unparalleled power. His descent into the darkness was simply this desire unraveling to the point it consumed him entirely. Saruman wasn't the only Istar who succumbed to the temptations of the mortal world. World. Even the blue wizards who traveled east were said to be leaders of secret cults and such. Radagast's soul remained incorrupt, but he gave himself entirely to the wilderness, which left only Gandalf to fulfill the original mission of the Istari. But back to Saruman, who was pushed closer to Sauron once he began studying the Rings of Power, seeing them as a means to his own end. He went so far as to forge a Ring of Power for himself, but no matter the lengths he went to, Sauron remained the one and only Dark Lord. When Gandalf made his way to Isengard, Saruman the White revealed himself as Sauron of many colors. Here, he also tried to coerce Gandalf into joining his cause. 
But once the Grey Pilgrim managed to escape, he headed straight to the Council of Elrond, where Saruman's deceptive deeds were revealed once and for all to the rest of the White Council. To sum it up, Saruman was always a liar, and he concealed his use of the Palantir from the rest of the Council. He also overruled the possibility of Gandalf leading the White Council purely of jealousy. Why didn't Sauruman just kill Gandalf? Who was stronger? Wouldn't it have been easier for Sauruman to simply kill Gandalf? I mean, the Grey Wizard kept throwing wrench after wrench into his schemes. But then, what story would we have left? Even when Gandalf wasn't fully aware of Sauruman's true nature, he continued making decisions in favor of the Istari mission, which in turn clashed with Sauruman's true intentions. Strategically, killing Gandalf the Grey would have been a foolish decision on Saruman's part, as it would have blown his cover instantly. Saruman had been working in the shadows, gradually uncovering forbidden knowledge that lured him into Sauron's grasp. All of this would be for naught, as his deception would be discovered by the Valar, and we know they were never lenient with their punishments. So, Saruman had no solid reason to kill Gandalf, no matter how much he wished to. Although, both the Astari were Maiar spirits, so they were technically immortal. So, Gandalf's physical shell could be slain, but not his spirit. Even when Gandalf the Grey was killed by Durin's Bane, he was sent back as Gandalf the White. If we were to compare the strengths of the two wizards, Gandalf emerged stronger when he became the White Wizard. As in Tolkien's lore, a steadfast theme remained, and good inevitably triumphed over evil. If anything, Saruman became weaker when he turned to the shadow, as his angelic essence had been tainted by the darkness. He had become a puppet in Sauron's larger game with hardly any independence. By the time the War of the Rings came to an end, Saruman was stripped of his powers, wizard staff, and his voice to a certain degree. The world is changing. What would happen if Saruman got the One Ring? Let's say that Saruman's Herculean efforts weren't in vain. In the end, he managed to keep the One Ring for himself and became the Lord of the Rings. But to even consider this, we have to remember that the One Ring was Sauron's essence. It was said that without the Ring, there is no Sauron. But without Sauron, would the Ring still exist? The Ring was at its most potent when wielded by its true master in the Second and Third Ages. Even when others bore the Ring, it eventually betrayed them and tried its hardest to get back to the Dark Lord. Now, there could only be two ways in which one could become the Lord of the Rings akin to Sauron. One would be to keep the Ring from Sauron and use it as leverage in your own favor. The other would be to gain the highest mastery over the One Ring in a way that emulates Sauron's connection. Even if Saruman managed to use the One Ring to his advantage, he'd be forced to be supremely quick with it before Sauron gets a chance to confront the White Wizard. As Tolkien clearly stated, the Rings of Power enhanced their wearer's innate abilities. In this case, Saruman's persuasiveness would be boosted to such a level that he would be able to turn Sauron's armies against their own master. He would use the One Ring to commandeer Sauron's forces, but under the ruse of being a fair and noble god. We know that since the fall of Numenor, Sauron was unable to take his fair form, so the free peoples of Middle-earth knew of the devilish evil that sought dominion over them. But Saruman could keep up the facade of being an emissary of the Valar, all the while crushing them under the boot of oppression. Similarly, it was popularly believed that Gandalf wielding the One Ring would be far worse than Saruman, or even Sauron. Since no one knew each kingdom of Middle-earth better than the Grey Pilgrim, he knew the people's minds inside and out. But voice out in the comments, how do you think Saruman would have used the One Ring if he had gotten his evil hands on it. This is just wild speculation, and honestly, we want to hear your thoughts on it. Saruman in other versions of the Legendarium and Adaptations Saruman was conceptualized differently in earlier drafts that Tolkien wrote. For one, he was named Sarumond or Saramund, and he was simply a very loyal servant of Sauron from the very beginning. In other drafts, Tolkien wrote Saruman as the traitor who handed Gandalf the Grey over to the Black Riders. Saruman is depicted in various other adaptations, whether animated or live action. To us, though, the character of Saruman cannot be envisioned without the actor who played him in Peter Jackson's trilogy. Did you know that Christopher Lee had originally wished to play Gandalf the Grey? As an avid reader of Tolkien's works, Lee actually got to meet the man himself. When the movies came along, we got to see how perfectly he portrayed the carefully masked ancientness of Saruman the White, a conniving wizard who slowly lets himself be devoured by greed for power. In a now deleted scene, Saruman suggests that Gandalf and he join forces to usurp Sauron and take command of Middle-earth. The scripts also nearly made Saruman the Darth Vader of a Palpatine Sauron. Of course, they didn't have as much wiggle room with Saruman's character, since Sir Christopher Lee was a devout fan of Tolkien's
Tolkien's writings and wish to stay as loyal to the source material as possible. Gandalf's interactions with Saruman may not suggest Saruman's beef against his fellow Istar, but the extended cut did more justice. The movies didn't give us Saruman of many colors, instead they chose to keep him as Saruman the White. This tells us just how deluded Saruman was. Even after turning into Sauron's puppet, he remained unaware of the fact that he was fallen, so to speak. Also, a cool detail was that Saruman's wizard staff resembled his Tower of Orthang. In The Fellowship of the Ring, the White Wizard correctly guessed that the Fellowship might try to take the mountain pass of Caradhras. So, with his booming voice, Saruman summoned avalanches of snow, which forced the company toward Moria. In the two towers, his connections to Theoden were depicted as a possession rather than a persuasive influence. In the extended edition of The Return of the King, Saruman was confronted by Gandalf the White and some of the Fellowship. In the end, Grima Wormtongue stabbed Saruman, who fell off his tower and was impaled by one of the great spikes of his own machines. In Jackson's Hobbit trilogy, Saruman was seen at a White Council meeting in Rivendell. Here, he rambled on and on about Radagast while Gandalf zoned out and conversed with Galadriel telepathically. In Ralph Bakshi's 1978 iteration titled The Lord of the Rings, Saruman was voiced by Fraser Kerr. The executives believed that the names Saruman and Sauron were too confusing, so they decided to name Saruman Aruman instead. This was later changed, but not throughout the movie. Hey, at least in this version, we got to see Saruman, I mean, Aruman of many colors. This exile crept from the shadows will never be crowned king. Marvelous verdict. Well, there you have it, folks. That's all we know about Saruman the White. The Istar fell into shadow, which was only the beginning of his long and painful end. As a Maya, Saruman was essentially immortal, but the Valar turned him away after his unfortunate deeds. So, he was left a wandering spirit, neither here nor there. Sounds like a fate worse than death. Saruman will forever remain a cautionary tale about how megalomania inevitably leads to madness. Also, the fact that people in positions of power can make or break the lives of those around them. Also, if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. And on that thought, this is Wizard Wheezy signing off for now, but you can always find me on Twitch. Thanks for watching, stay safe out there, and have a marvelous day.